Welcome to the Meat and Potatoes podcast. Today we're joined by two doctors, Dr. Jack Zenger and Dr. Joseph Folkman from Zenger Folkman. How are you, gentlemen? Doing Very well good. Today. Hello, Thank Gary. You. Yeah. Good to hear. All right. Um, let's start with you, uh, Dr. Zenger. What is um, Zenger Folkman and what do you guys do? <laughs> well, we're a company that specializes in helping organizations to develop their leaders. And, and we use some technology that helps leaders gain greater self awareness and design for themselves a, a plan of development that will help them to become ever better. We, we're deep believers that uh, everybody that goes to work for an organization deserves to work for a good boss. And our, our crusade and mission is to help that person be the best possible leader that he or she can be. Gotcha. And are these uh, leaders from small, medium, big size companies? Where do they come yes. from? <laughs> yes. We obviously uh, like to work with large organizations, but many of our clients are mid-sized. We don't do a lot of work with small, you know, 25 or 50 people in an organization, but we, we know that we start there sometimes, but many of our organizations are, are huge. I mean, they have uh, hundreds of thousands of employees and they obviously are clients that you value. Sure, yeah. All right, and then Dr. Folkman, um, where did the idea come from for you two to join forces and, uh, and create this company? Well, Jack and I actually were next to each other in offices uh, in a previous company that we'd, we'd both uh, been part of. And Jack used to knock on my door and ask really hard questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so he'd ask a question. And one of the things that we've based our company on is we have tons of data. We have you know, data right now from over 1.5 million assessors on 110,000 leaders. And it's amazing what you can do if you just look at that data. The data is actually 360 assessments of leaders. That's where leaders get feedback from their boss, their peers, the direct reports and others. And typically there's about 13 people that rate them. Now, what we've discovered from that is, is that it really gives an accurate view and an, an accurate uh, metric of how good you are as a leader. And so Jack would ask these questions. And one of the things that we were doing when we started was I used to go out and give leaders feedback. And I'd say, you know, look at the data here. And when you get feedback, typically people go, okay, what's wrong with me? So I'd say, yeah, figure out what's wrong with you. And when Jack and I looked at the data, we made a fabulous discovery. Uh, we discovered that 70% of the time, a leader would be better off focusing on what they do well and building a strength than they would fixing weaknesses. That was a huge change in how we delivered feedback and how we help people change. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so these leaders, uh, if they're getting assessed and, uh, and, and getting the feedback, um, is it the leaders that will reach out to you um, as you know, prospective clients? Or is it the disgruntled employee reaching out and saying, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> come in and help with our leader? How does it work? Well, oftentimes it's their bosses that reach out, right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, we have this funny experience where, you know, the senior leaders of an organization, they bring us in and say, go fix those guys, right? And part of the problem is, is the people we need to fix is them, <laughs> right? But it's like, go fix those guys. And, and, and so what, what happens is, and people are getting a better attitude about this, what we've discovered is, is if people have a mindset of developing and they can and think about getting better every year and improving, what they need is a baseline. How good am I? And if you ask people, are you a good leader? They go, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Well, are you? Or are you kind of really bad at some things? Or are you, you know, and so we give them a baseline. And then our suggestion is find one thing, one, one behavior to work on and work on that one behavior. And the reason for that is we found if you didn't have any strengths and a strength was a competency in the 90th percentile, 
your average effectiveness would be the 34th percentile. But if you did one thing well, and we measured people on 16 or 19 different things, if you did one thing well, your average effectiveness went from the 34th percentile to the 64th percentile with one profound strength. It can make a big difference in how people are perceived. Yeah. Dave, the other piece of information that may be useful to you is that you know, the majority of really successful companies understand the importance of investing in their people. So our primary customer is the head of leadership development for the organization or the HRVP or the chief human resources officer. They're the ones who bring us in. And so it is they who kind of contract with us to provide this service to their leaders in the organization. So I'm not sure if that helps answer your question about how do we make connections? It's not usually through the employee. It's not usually directly with the managers. It's through the HR function within organizations that it typically happens. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, you guys mentioned how much data you have, and um, you guys have, have been doing this for a while, and uh, it's a lot uh, to manage and, and think through. But um, you know, a lot of folks have read really good leadership books. Um, and there's a lot of uh, varying opinions and, uh, and methodologies. Uh, with all of that, and plus your own opinions, how do you guys come up with kind of your playbooks and formats that uh, boil it down and, and make it digestible? You know, Warren Bennis, who is the president of a university, once said that more is written and less is known about leadership than any other topic. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack, why don't you answer the rest of that question? I wanted to throw that quote in there. Well, we, uh, because we have this wonderful database, you are able to then, as you, as you have questions asked of you by your clients sometimes, or as you think about questions, you're able to look in the database and, and get answers to them. So, you know, this big question that, that Joe was talking about, should people work on their weaknesses? Or should they focus on their things that they're kind of getting B pluses on and they could get A's? Uh, and we, we found the answer to that. Uh, the question about does, does age make a difference? Does gender make a difference? Does where you live make a big difference? And our culture is different in terms of leadership behavior and practices. When you have a large database, you can go in and, and find the answers to all those, you know, all those really interesting questions. Um, and the, the, the question that, you know, has come up of late is about, you know, women and men, particularly in this time of this pandemic. And uh, fortunately, when you have data, you can, you can give people more than just opinions. You can give them some data that's really based on some facts and, and has more empirical backing. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, you guys wrote a, uh, a story and did, and did data. It was in the Harvard Business Review that women are better in, in times of crisis as far as leadership goes. Um, so if you can summarize it, like the starting point of you know, where that idea came from and then how you guys used your data and the end point being you know, the publication and stuff, what's the process? Well, not all women are better than all men. It, it, but if we take a group, and originally we looked at 40,000 men and 22,000 women, and we said, who's better? And what we found is on, 16, uh, on 13 of 16 competencies, women scored higher, statistically higher on 13 of 16 competencies. And in this study we did just in the pandemic, we looked at data we'd gathered from March uh, to July in 2020. So just the beginning of that pandemic. And in that data set, we had about 300 women and about 500 men. And we, we wondered, would this show up? Would that differentiate? And so we measure people on these competencies and what we saw are some big differences on some competencies and, and you know, what was the implication of that? And, and what we found is, is there were some big differences and women tended to be better on a lot of those competencies. Gotcha. You know, Dave, back in the 1970s, there was a man named Tom Peters who wrote a book with a colleague. The book was called In Search of Excellence. 
Um, Tom was a, a friend and a colleague of mine. And, and uh, one day he said to me, just kind of offhand, he said, you know, Jack, I think women are better leaders than men. And I said, well, why do you say that? I have no, no data. I just kind of, my, my, that's my gut feeling. So years later, we were able to kind of answer that question. But it's been a, a question that's been around for, for a long time. <laughs> Well, and, and typically when we tell people about this, they, uh, many people will say, well, yes, the nurturing competencies, they're better at that. They're, they're better at relationship building and developing others. Uh, what we found was that while that's true, they are better at the nurturing competencies. The top six competencies that they were better at in the study was number one, taking initiative. <laughs> that, that when they see a problem, they jump on it. Number two was learning agility. They're, they were, you know, a lot quicker at sort of changing direction. And boy, in the pandemic, we really needed to do that. The third one was inspiring and motivating others. You know, there's two ways to get people to change. One is to push and the other is to pull. Women were a lot better at the pull part, the, you know, kind of rather than you've got to do this and pushing. The, the fourth one was developing others. They were, you know, and, and people really appreciate that. They, they, they felt, especially in the pandemic, you know, that the organization was having struggles and, you know, that, that, you know, the employees are last or they felt like that, but when they were developed, they felt much better that, and then the next one was building relationships, uh, really creating and, and, that was so necessary in the pandemic that people wanted to be listened to. When you think about balancing work and, and people that, you know, they needed to shift from like 60% focus on work to 40% people that needed to shift from 60% focus on that person, 40% people, because people were very scared in the start of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what, What's the end result of, of these types of research uh, projects for you guys and your firm? Is it a, is it a lead generator? Um, how does it kind of fold back into the company and the, you know, the, the balance sheet, the p and <laughs> Well, there's no question that when you can publish your, your work and your ideas in reputable publications like Harvard Business Review and Forbes and and LinkedIn publishes some things for us and other talent quarterly publishes for us. Uh, that does build credibility in the marketplace. And it does, when people are thinking about leadership development, uh, they, you know, they, they will often kind of search you out. Uh, so it certainly does build reputation, build brand image. Uh, and that's how we use it primarily. It also informs the kind of products and services that we provide and sort of it kind of it shapes uh, what we do and the kind of recommendations that we we make for people. Yeah. So, um, you know, over the years in your guys' careers, what have been a, a few of your favorite um, research data sets and ultimately like a, a complete package? You, you did the research, you did the publication. What were some of the ones that you liked either because they were surprising or you just really enjoyed it? Well, this women topic was very popular and, and, and it got a lot of press. Uh, another one that I really liked, Jack, was uh, this article we did on, we, we looked at leaders and, and we looked at this question of, if you have a bad leader, does that affect you? And if you have a really good leader, does that affect you? So what we looked at is if you had a really, really bad leader at the bottom 10%, <laughs> then we looked at their direct reports and how they were rated. We found that they were rated significantly lower than average. And if you had a really great leader that you worked for, it, would that affect? Yeah, it, it's, they were significantly better than average. And, and uh, that paper, we published that in Harvard Business Review. And I think we called that, that or I, I forget who came up with the title, the trickle down effect, right? That, <laughs> That, you know, that, that really a lot of the ways people learn how to lead is they, they look at their boss and what they do and we mimic other people. 
but it really does. I mean, as you think about in an organization, if you're led by a great leader, it, 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 it's a little bit like the ceiling, right? You raise the ceiling for everybody and, and, and people, you know, they kind of come up to it. And if you work for a bad leader, guess what? You're not going to be much better. That's the sad part of that. <laughs> Jack, what else? Yeah, some other favorite topics for me have been early on in our research, we, we discovered that probably the most powerful leadership behavior uh, was one that we've called inspires and motivates. And that led us to kind of do further research and kind of thinking about that more because when you say those words to people, they kind of glaze over a little bit, not knowing exactly what does that mean that a leader needs to do. So we, we did a lot of further digging and we published a book called The Inspiring Leader. Uh, we did some, I think, really fun research around the fact that, that the most effective leaders tend to be uh, a brisk pace. They, we've written a book called Speed and it's not, not about drugs, it's about, it's about the pace with which leaders elect to move and, and do things and trying to point out the benefits of maintaining a fairly fast paced organization. So there, there have been a whole series of kind of fun topics that, that have sort of had as their em embryo the, the data that we have, which then led us to, to be able to kind of come up with better answers about how to help people. And maybe, maybe the final and maybe most important insight that we've gained is a, a notion that we've uh, coined the term companion behaviors or competency companions. So what we found was that for any leadership competency that really distinguishes great leaders, there's a number of other behaviors that kind of go hand in hand with that. So they're kind of like they're glued together. Uh, and so someone who was really good at strategic thinking was also really good at a few other things. People who were bad at strategic thinking were kind of poor at those same handful of things. That opened the door to saying, okay, so when you're giving advice to somebody about how they might get better at some specific leadership competency, they're not just stuck with how do I do more of that or work harder at it or push hard, you know, push, push further, but are there some other things that I can be doing that really kind of bring me in the side door and the back door and, and are the, the, the behaviors that go hand in hand with that. That I think has been one of our most exciting kind of discoveries. Yeah, cool. Um, so you guys are obviously passionate about leadership. You've built your careers around uh, consulting and writing and about it. Um, where did that passion come from? Well, uh, it, it's a, it's a really interesting thing about being able to help people improve. If you think about a, a fun kind of a, a, of a place, uh, as we sit down with people, um, we give them an assessment and it gives them a view of how they're doing. And, and the view isn't coming from us. It's coming from the people that work with them every day, the people that know them really well. And, one of the things that we try to do when they get that assessment is we try to say, you know, what really matters is what you stand out. What's your brand? What could you be really good at? And helping people to kind of figure out a way, but also giving them the tools. You know, when Jack talked about these companion behaviors, it's, you know, when people say, I want to be more inspiring and they go, okay. What do, you, what do I do? Get up and give a big speech? And, and it turns out that there's some simple things like make an emotional connection, uh, connect with people more often. And when you do that, bring your, bring your positive attitude with you. Another thing you can do to be more inspiring is help people focus on the vision. What are we trying to do here? What's our, what's our vision and strategy for how we're going to succeed? A third thing is the way you communicate. Uh, helping people under, understand the what, the where, the why, and the how, but also doing it in a way that excites people and gets them going. That is a, you know, that is 
really, really a very enjoyable thing to do. This year has been challenging because we used to do it in person. And this year we've been doing it on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's been a real change for us. Yeah. And Dave, my fascination with leadership began as a young boy. My father happened to be a hospital administrator. And so as a young boy, I'd go over and kind of file x-rays and mow the front lawn and do a few other things around this hospital. And I began to watch, you know, the, the head nurse and the person who was in charge of the dietitian in the kitchen area and people who were administrative folks. And I could see the influence that a person could have over the, both the organization's effectiveness and its destiny, but also how, how they impacted other people. So the, what fascinated me about leadership was this enormous leverage that it gives somebody for good and, and also for ill sometimes. And so as I went into, got through, went through college and I got a degree in psychology and, and decided to go on, uh, the, the topic of leadership just always was at the heart of what I was, I found interesting. Yeah. Yeah, leadership's a, a really fun and, and broad topic. Um, I'm reading a book right now about pirates, actually. It's called The Republic <laughs> of Pirates. And, uh, you know, the, starting reading it out, you know, you know, you'd expect to learn a few things about pirates, but you learn a ton about um, economics and slavery and um, all sorts of stuff inadvertently through the book. But then um, as I was getting ready to talk with you guys, like those pirate captains, were amazing leaders, right? <laughs> uh, you know, they had to manage probably a much more complex machine than any any company because uh, the stakes were so high and uh, people got to vote them out and all of those things. And, uh, you know, that you can help train and, and develop leaders and improve them all. But I think some people are uh, naturally inclined and they get it and they see around the corners and they just take to it like a duck to water. Would you agree or disagree with that, that leaders sometimes are born with a, a good head start? You know, uh, that's a, a question that is most uh, is the most frequently asked question uh, that, that comes to us. People just kind of often when they first hear about what you're interested in, what you do, uh, it's not very long before they'll say, well, you know, are, are, aren't leaders born that way? Or, you know, are leaders really made? And I think the reason why that question has lingered so long is that we haven't always even given people the, the, the complete answer. So yeah. let me give you the let me give you the complete answer in, in, in a nutshell. The answer is probably about one third of it is is genetic and hardwired, and about two thirds is kind of it's from nurture and it's from people's deliberate desire to become a more effective leader. So, you know, there's a little bit of, of, of uh, nature in it, but if you're comfortable with saying, okay, the, the preponderant, uh, you know, kind of force behind whether a person's a good leader or not is deliberate skill building, deliberate paying attention to what works, you know, being willing to learn, being willing to improve, continuously get better, then I think leaders are made. And... The, 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 key, the key argument, I guess, we would make is that every leader, no matter how good he or she is, whatever their position is in an organization, they can get better. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, one kind of last question, then we'll wrap up. Um, what are you guys excited about that you're currently working on or you plan to work on in the next year to two years? Well, I, I think one of the things that excites me the most, Garrett, is the, the idea that we really can help people change and improve, that we really can, you know, that pe this, this, we call it a growth mindset. That's a term that was coined by a professor at Stanford named Carol Dweck. But, the, you know, a lot of people walk around and they think they're fixed. You can't really change people. We've we, there's no research to support that. The research we have supports the fact that people can grow and learn and develop and get better. And so, you know, we're, we've got some new tools and some processes 
One of the things that we've been trying to do is something called micro learning experiences. And we're actually having one of those this month. Uh, we're gonna talk about the topic of strategic perspective, but we're trying to do it in one hour. <laughs> and so what we do is we have a little pre-assessment we give people, they, they come and they attend the webinar and, and, and we give them some ideas about what they can do to become more strategic and they walk out of there with a plan. And, and that's a kind of a challenge for us, but micro learning, that's an interesting thing we're trying to do. What else, Jack? Well, and I would echo what, what Joe has said, and that is that uh, ultimately leadership development is about behavior change. And we're, we're trying to find ever better, ever more efficient ways to help people uh, develop new habits, good new habits and to, to, to jettison old habits that kind of get in their way. And uh, the, the, the quest to find uh, more, more efficient, more effective ways to do that is what really challenges me for the future. Yeah, it's exciting times. And uh, it, it helps that you guys love what you do. Uh, all right, I lied. I have one more question. So if <laughs> you were to ask me, Who's your favorite leader? Who, who do you think's the best leader? Um, I would say Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask you guys, see if you can answer that question. Who's your favorite leader of all time? Uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you mine, and it may be a person you've never heard of, uh, but his, his name is Andrew Pearson. Uh, he had been a very prominent uh, McKinsey consultant, then he became a pretty senior executive in several firms. He was on the cover of Fortune at one time as being America's toughest, one of, one of the 10 toughest bosses in America. Uh, he was a, in his 80s when he joined an organization as their chairman, uh, an organization called YUM. Mm. And YUM had a, as its president, a very engaging, very different kind of leader. And Andral Pearson uh, kind of accompanied him in going out to visit some of the, the franchises and he saw how, how he operated. And in his late or in mid eighties, he wrote that he had really had to completely change his belief about what what a good manager did and that he was what he had done in his early part of his career was not as effective as what he saw this new this younger president of yum doing in terms of the way you work with people so i admire that uh, maybe it's because i'm 89 years of age and i, I believe we can still learn we can acquire new skills uh, yeah. but that, that a person who had attained as much success as he had would be willing to acknowledge what I was doing was not right, not the best. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to go for the heart here on this, Garrett. So, I, you know, a, a leader I mostly admire would be my mother. And um, she worked uh, as a dietitian and in charge of the uh, food services at an old folks home. And uh, she, was so concerned about, you know, giving them great meals, tasty meals, the right diet. You know, she, she led by example. She was selfless in the process. Um, and and uh, she was just such a great example to me of, of, you know, putting other people first. And, and she never had a hard time keeping people because everybody wanted to work for her. And most people love to be around her because she cooked so well. <laughs> and, and that's the, you know, if there's one thing I learned for if you want to, if you want to be valued, cook well. <laughs> there you go. That's a good shortcut. All right. Well, cool. I guess now that we're friends, I can call you Jack and Joe. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, join us and I've really enjoyed the chat and uh, we look forward to your uh, continued success and reading uh, these uh, publication and articles that you put out. Sure, thanks very much. We've enjoyed this uh, time with you. Thank you. All right. Good Have interview.